My name is Raheem Thompson. I am the manager of public programs. On behalf of, of the museum and our CEO, Susan, a Susan Abrams, I would like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's program with Annie Segan and Brody Hefner. Uh, through the lens of Arthur Rothstein, her father. Um, with this program, we're gonna get a very special presentation from them and they will go through, highlight his 50 year career beyond his 10 year professional work in the service. Um, Annie will begin with a quick introduction and start with a PowerPoint slide. If you have any questions, please leave them in the chat. We will get to as many questions as possible. Otherwise, I hope you all have a great program. Thank you. Thank you, Raheem. Thank you very much, Raheem. And we want to thank, Brody and I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, we especially want to thank Susan Abrams and Ariel Weininger and Raheem. Thank you all for, for your support and for this beautiful exhibition. I hope you're all gonna get there to see it. We hope to get there in person to see it too. Right now we're in New York City. Through the magic of Zoom, we're joining you. <laughs> so uh, here we go, right? We're gonna start with our presentation. We will share our screen with you. And begin the presentation. Here we go. I can't see that. Okay. All right, hello. Uh, I'm Ann Rothstein Segan. And I'm Brody Hefner. And we're excited to introduce you to my father's extraordinary photographic legacy. Dad's photo essay of the Shanghai Jewish community produced over just a few days during Passover in the spring of 1946 was more than just the coincidence of a photographer finding himself in the right place at the right time. You see, by 1946, Arthur had been refining the craft of creating picture stories for quite some time. So today, I'll share his story with you through Dad's favorite mode of communicating ideas, picture stories. In the early 1900s, pioneering social documentary photographers used images to expose social problems like child labor and slum conditions. And by the 1930s, photography revolutionized magazines and newspapers. In this era before television, picture stories and magazines were a primary source of visual news and entertainment. But but photographs remained a powerful tool to expose social injustice. And Arthur Rothstein's entire career was an embodiment of that idea. My father studied the work of the pioneers of social documentary photography. Then, through a series of events I'll tell you about in a minute, he began his photography career as a social documentary photographer. Although he started out as a social documentary photographer, his career encompassed so much more. If you asked my dad what his specialty was, he'd say, my specialty is versatility. When your father is a world-renowned photographer, you end up with a very special family photo album. At the end of my talk, our talk, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll, we'll treat you to just a few family pictures. This image of an Oklahoma dust storm is Arthur Rothstein's most famous photograph. It became an iconic symbol of the Great Depression and the Dust Bowl. I'll also tell you the story behind this photograph in a few minutes. But let's start with an overview. The timeline across the bottom of the screen represents Arthur Rothstein's 50-year career, from his Columbia University graduation in 1935 until his death in 1985. He was a photographer for many organizations and publications. I'll tell you about each of them, but first, a little family history. Arthur Rothstein on the left was the oldest of three sons born to Eastern European Jewish immigrants in 1915 in New York City. 
He was a first-generation American who grew up in a Yiddish-speaking Orthodox home. At the turn of the 20th century, Arthur's parents and maternal grandparents were chased out of Europe, dispossessed by government-sanctioned pogroms. His family joined the wave of two million Eastern European Jews who immigrated to America from the 1880s to the 1920s. In his social documentary work, Dad was always drawn to stories of immigrants and the dispossessed, people who were compelled to relocate by forces beyond their control. Throughout his life, he promoted the use of photography as, in his own words, an instrument of communication for the good of society. He felt compelled to help repair the world in accordance with the Jewish concept of tikkun olam, which for him was synonymous with taking action in pursuit of social justice. When he was 13, dad received a camera from his uncle for his bar mitzvah. They built a dark room together and Arthur learned how to process film. He used his new camera to take this artistic picture of his uncle by matchlight. My father credited his education and he, my father credited his education at PS 45, a middle school in the Bronx, with much of his practical know-how. The principal, Angelo Patry, was a student of John Dewey and an advocate of learning by doing. Patry believed that everyone should know how to work with their hands. So in middle school, Arthur learned how to print and bind books, how to do mechanical drawing, plumbing, electrical work, and basic carpentry. In June of 1931, at age 15, he graduated from Stuyvesant High School in New York City. That's him right here, front and center. In those days, boys younger than 16 wore short pants, not trousers. In the fall of 1931, at age 16, dad entered Columbia University. At Columbia, he set up the university camera club. Here's a picture of the club members sitting on the newly opened George Washington Bridge. During, oh, here he is. There's dad right there. Hi, dad. During college, Arthur earned extra money making photocopies. There was no such thing as digital photography or copy machines back then. If you wanted a copy of a document or an image, you took a, you took a picture with your camera. And it's funny, many people nowadays have absolutely no idea what a dark room is or the work required to develop and print pictures from film. And I'll tell you a little more now. <laughs> Meanwhile, in 1932, Franklin D. Roosevelt won his first presidential bid by promising the, to end the profound misery being caused by the Great Depression. He implemented the New Deal, a series of federal programs enacted in response to the Great Depression. One of FDR's New Deal programs was the Resettlement Administration, an agency that assisted displaced farmers and industrial workers with grants, loans, and housing. At Columbia, Arthur had made photographs the old-fashioned way for one of his professors, Roy Stryker. In 1935, Stryker was, Stryker was recruited by FDR to promote the Resettlement Administration. Stryker believed that the best way to promote the agency's programs was to provide visual evidence that Americans needed assistance from their government. He sent for Arthur to help set up the photo unit right after his graduation of in 1935. With this job in Stryker's photo unit, Arthur began a very productive decade of government service. Over the eight years of the program during which he worked in the photo unit for Roy Stryker, more than a dozen photographers worked there, including five women. The photo unit provided free of charge to newspapers and magazines, uh, images of all kinds. It also used photographs in its own promotional materials. This poster is a typical example of how Stryker used photographs to promote resettlement administration projects and programs. And you can see the, the photos labeled as to the different programs across the top and the bottom. 
Despite his excellent education, Arthur had not traveled outside of the New York City area. He was a city kid and only learned how to drive when he got hired in Washington. He spent much of the next seven years driving around the United States on photo assignments that could last for weeks or months. Dad traveled with several cameras and lots of film and equipment. He often slept in his car, so he had a sleeping bag, a portable stove, and a coffee maker. There was no interstate highway system back then. Dad often drove down dirt roads, so he had an axe to chop down trees that got in the way and a shovel to dig himself out of snow or mud. In the fall of 1935, Stryker gave Arthur one of his first big assignments. In the hills of Virginia, hundreds of families were being relocated out of what would soon become Shenandoah National Park, the first national park in the eastern United States. In the parkland, high up in isolated mountain hollows, families were living in primitive conditions. In Shenandoah, Arthur would create a picture story illustrating a way of life that would soon be gone forever. In response to the picture story, the federal government constructed clusters of homes in the foothills just below the park for the displaced farm families. The displacement and relocation of families from Shenandoah National Park was covered by newspapers and magazines across the country. This was a typical example of how the photo unit's images were used. Now I will return to the story of my father's most famous photograph. When this picture was made in April of 1936, America was in the depths of the Great Depression. But one of the biggest stories of the time was the severe drought in the windswept part of the country that became known as the Dust Bowl. The desperate conditions were difficult for most Americans to even imagine. So Stryker assigned Arthur to go there and send back photographs. This is Amarillo in the Texas Panhandle. Note the heavy, metal signs swinging in the strong winds. In the worst of the Dust Bowl area near Boys City in the Oklahoma Panhandle, my father visited the Coble Farm. As he was leaving, a dust storm began to kick up the sandy soil of their desolate farm. Dad ran for his car, but turned around to wave goodbye and took this picture showing Art Coble and his two boys, Milton and Darrell, hustling back to their house. The image touched a nerve. It has been printed in countless newspapers, magazines, and books, and became one of the most widely reproduced pictures of the 20th century. At the time, my father was just 20 years old. Now this photograph is in major museums around the world. And now a little more background about the Dust Bowl. It was a, a situation caused by a combination of human impact on the environment and natural forces. In the Dust Bowl area, the deeply rooted prairie grass had, been, had kept the topsoil in place for thousands of years. But during the 1920s and early 30s, the soil was churned with gang plows like this one. Millions of acres of drought resistant prairie grass were replaced with vast fields of wheat. In the rush to plant wheat, almost no attempt was made to prevent soil erosion. At the same time, a widespread and persistent drought, much like today actually, was co <sighs> concentrated in the Great Plains. The worst conditions were in the Texas and Oklahoma panhandles and neighboring states. This is a very flat and windy part of the country. The combination of strong winds, exposed soil, and significant drought produced black blizzards. They carried millions of tons of stinging, blinding dirt across the Great Plains and across the nation. Dust would swirl through the air, suffocating people and livestock with dust pneumonia. The title of this photograph by Arthur Rothstein is Dust Storm Over the Panhandle and the Town of Amarillo, Texas, 1936. That car is being chased by an enormous dust storm cloud. Thousands of ruined farmers and ranchers had to sell or abandon their land in the Dust Bowl area. 
and their starving livestock. Farm animals had no grass to graze on. All that was left for many of the families of the Great Plains were failed crops, repossessed farms, and the very real possibility of starvation. Those were the desperate conditions that Arthur Rothstein's photographs conveyed to people in other parts of the country. There was another facet to the Dust Bowl story. All across the Great Plains, families pulled up stakes and relocated in search of work and greener pastures, like this farmer relocating his goods in Tennessee. This map shows the major westward migration routes from the Great Plains to California, Washington, and Oregon. This saga was made famous at the time in real time by John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath, and the movie version of the story starring Henry Fonda. Arthur's coverage of the plight and migration of farmers from the Dust Bowl inspired John Steinbeck while he was writing The Grapes of Wrath. The title of this photograph is Family Forced to Move by Drought, South Dakota, 1936. Hundreds of thousands left the Great Plains states. This is Vernon Evans of Lemon, South Dakota. Dad photographed him near Missoula, Montana on Highway 10. He and his family had left their farm, which was in a grasshopper ridden and drought stricken area for a new start in Oregon. En route, they lived in a tent and covered about 200 miles a day in their Model T Ford. In this photograph, my father captures the heartfelt gratitude of a North Dakota farmer and his son who were thanking President Roosevelt for their farm loan. In 1937, Stryker's photo unit merged into the Farm Security Administration at the Department of Agriculture and was known thereafter as the FSA photo unit. The FSA photo unit continued to produce important photo essays about difficulties faced by Americans during the Depression. Here's another of my father's picture stories that was picked up by the press. In Missouri, over a thousand tenant farmers were forced off the land they had worked for generations. The landowners discovered that it was cheaper to hire day workers or lease a tractor than it was to have sharecroppers living and working on their land. In protest, a thousand black and white tenant farmers demonstrated along a hundred miles of state highway. Entire families were camped out for weeks, and this was during the middle of the winter. The state of Missouri was embarrassed by the situation, so state police forced families to move away from the highway. Picture stories that appeared in newspapers throughout the country caught the attention of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, and she prompted her husband to act on the farmer's behalf. After President Roosevelt intervened, the protesters were given grant assistance and some were moved to resettlement housing. Agricultural workers weren't the only ones having a hard time during the Great Depression. Arthur Rothstein also documented the struggles of the unemployed in cities and challenges faced by the unemployed in mining communities and, in, and industrial areas. This unemployed coal miner was living with his family in a shanty he constructed at the city dump near Heron, Illinois. Here's a shoeshine man in New York City. My dad often included signage in his documentary photographs. This one with the quote is a great example. Uh, this is a great quote. The secret of success in life is for a man to be ready for his opportunity when it comes. Look at that. Here's another urban scene not far from where my father grew up in the Bronx. Many of the residents in this community were unemployed Jewish garment workers. The government built a community designed to employ several hundreds of these workers and house their families in Monmouth County, New Jersey. It was called Jersey Homesteads. Shortly after FDR's death, the community was renamed Roosevelt, New Jersey. Around the time of the late 1930s, Stryker began to expand the mission of his photo unit. He wanted to create a complete documentary portrait of America, a, a real national historical record. When the FSA photographers went out into the field on assignment, they photographed more than just drought conditions and government relief projects. 
they began to photograph everything about life all over America. Roy Stryker was an academic, so the photo unit was kind of an academic seminar. He made sure that his photographers were knowledgeable about each of their assignments. For instance, if Arthur was going to shoot in an area where cotton was grown, he was expected to read, to read all about cotton production in this economic encyclopedia, R.J. Russell Smith's North America. Each of the photographers owned a copy of this book, which was very convenient before you could look things up on the internet. <laughs> Arthur was expected to read up on the social aspects of the cotton industry, for example, child labor. He had to understand the history and culture of cotton growing, including the plantation system. The photographer's research made them better visual storytellers. During these formative years, Arthur Rothstein was developing the skills he used throughout his career to create compelling picture stories. Stryker often provided shooting scripts to the photographers and he told them, while you're out there, get a portrait of what life is really like. So you can see from this script, Main Street, get out there and shoot what, what stores and theaters and garages and barbershops look like there. And down at the bottom, what keeps the town going? A study of local industries would be of great value. So these were not carefully defined scripts, but general guidelines of the types of things they wanted to capture. During the 30s, smaller and lighter 35 millimeter cameras became available for the first time. In this image, Arthur has two cameras around his neck. He's, he's holding a 35, uh, around his neck, he's holding a 35 millimeter camera, one of the new smaller cameras. The larger camera is a Zeiss Super Icon to B with its square two and a quarter inch film format. Arthur enjoyed using the compact 35 millimeter cameras that enabled him to quickly capture intimate interior photographs like this Cuban cigar maker working at home in Key West, Florida. And spontaneous close-ups like this young bean picker photographed in Maryland. And this girl picking cranberries in New Jersey. Note the descriptive title that three quarters of the pickers are children at this cranberry farm. The New Deal significantly reduced child labor in many industries under the National Industrial Recovery Act. However, the protection did not extend to agricultural workers initially. When it came to farm families, all hands worked. Arthur continued to document America's, Americans suffering and celebrating. This is a high school parade shot on Main Street in Butte, Montana in 1939. Dad loved the West so much that he published a book titled The American West in the 30s. Roy Stryker told this interesting story in an oral history recorded for the Archive of American Art in 1964. Stryker said, Arthur went out to do the cattle story on the Brewster Ranch in Montana. They were intrigued with Arthur's knowledge of the cattle business. They got involved and became Arthur's helpers to get the right pictures. Later on, Mr. Brewster stopped in to see me in Washington and thanked me for sending Arthur Rothstein. He said, Mr. Brewster, we have been quite anti-Semitic at our ranch, but we were so delighted with Arthur Rothstein that our anti-Semitism just left us when we watched Arthur work. So dad was an ambassador for the Jewish people as well as a photographer. Remember, during the years leading up to America's participation in World War II, American Jews were often vilified. Dad's trips to the West resulted in a lifelong affection for cowboy culture. Roy Stryker, who grew up on a ranch, was impressed that a Jewish kid from the Bronx could ride a horse while taking pictures. After five years on the road and after crisscrossing the country several times, Arthur was exhausted. He took a job as staff photographer for Look Magazine in his hometown of New York. Arthur had not lost his social conscience when he went to work for Look. His new position gave him the opportunity, opportunity to create picture stories that brought important social issues to light, including race rela relations. This picture is part of a picture story that highlighted the indignities of daily life suffered by a young black man living in the South and was run in Look Magazine in 1941. 
As America mobilized for war, the FSA photo unit became part of the U.S. Office of War Information, or OWI. The OWI photo unit now supported the publicity and propaganda needs of America's war effort after Arthur, uh, Arthur left Look and rejoined the photo unit at the OWI. This enormous World War II display promoted defense bonds. It was initially in, it was installed in Grand Central Terminal in New York. The display incorporated several of Arthur's photographs to create an emotional impact on the public. The OWI photographers were tasked with creating picture stories like this one, which shows the happy family of a defense plant worker living in housing provided by Reynolds Aluminum. Of course, our, our military aircraft were largely made of aluminum at that time, so that was a critical industry and received a lot of government support, including housing for the workers, a great idea. <laughs> the OWI photographers also began to experiment at that time with the new Kodachrome color film that had just become available a couple of years earlier. This image shows wartime pilot training in Texas. For almost nine years, Roy Stryker's photographers had, cre had created more than 200,000 photographs af after all those years. By the time the photo unit was closed down in 1944, Stryker made sure that his body of work was protected and would be preserved. The photo collection, which they referred to as the file, is shown in this picture from the 1940s. The collection resides at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. The file is really considered a national treasure and is freely available to the public, to the American people. This is a recent photograph of Annie doing some research there at the Library of Congress, prints and photographs, reading room in the FSA OWI collection. This is what the file drawers look like. It shows you how the files are mounted and you can see how the images are indexed. If you can't get to Washington DC, you can go online and view many of the images on the Library of Congress website. In 1943, Arthur Rothstein joined the U.S. Army Signal Corps and employed his skills as a photographer to support the Allied war effort against the Axis powers. The Signal Corps was responsible for transmitting information using any means available, including homing pigeons. The ranks of the Signal Corps included pigeon trainers known as Pigeoneers. However, times had changed with all the new radio technology. There was no longer a need for all those pigeons. So one of Arthur's early duties in the Signal Corps was to retrain Pigeoneers as combat photographers. At first, Dad tried to convince the brass to utilize the many photographers already in the Army, but his superiors were intent on retraining those pigeon handlers. So that's what Dad did. Here he is with his former pigeoneers, now trained combat photographers. Dad was sent to Asia with his newly trained combat photographers. They were part of the 164th Signal Corps Photo Company. Here he is reading the news of the end of the war in Europe. He was in India, and war was still raging in Asia. From India, he traveled with a military convoy over the treacherous Burma Road. It was used by the Allies to, oh, what happened? It was used by the Allies to support, uh, the, to supply the Chinese in their war against Japan. If you look very closely, you can see that each dot is a large army truck. This narrow section of the road had no shoulder or guardrail to prevent accidents. Dad said the trip was terrifying, but the scenery was breathtaking. When the war was over, in August 1945, there was a transportation bottleneck. Everybody was trying to relocate at the same time. Many people were trying to return to their homes within China. Tens of thousands of Japanese soldiers had surrendered and needed to be shipped out. There, was all, there were also refugees from all over the world who needed to leave China. By the spring of 1946, Dad was still in uniform and still in China. So he took a short three-month assignment as chief photographer in China for the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administration, known as UNRWA. 
China had been at war with Japan since 1937, so the Chinese economy and infrastructure were in terrible conditions. UNRWA had committed $600 million to help China recover, an enormous project. The war had disrupted food production, so millions were suffering famine. China needed to help needed help to rebuild, to feed starving people, and to relocate all those displaced by war. UNRWA provided vital equipment, including 2,000 tractors. This was the type of documentary photography assignment that Arthur had a lot of experience with from his years with the FSA photo unit. On behalf of UNRWA, Dad traveled extensively in China documenting, and his dad traveled extensively in China <laughs> doc documenting the famine. As he did for the FSA, Arthur photographed relief efforts. This picture shows the distribution of rice paid for by UNRWA. Mm -hmm. Arthur Rothstein also was also documenting the agency's assistance to displace people. UNRWA had a special responsibility to help the community of stateless European Jews now stranded in Shanghai after the war. Arthur created a portrait of that community, which is the focus of the exhibition now at the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center. You'll learn all about that extraordinary story in the exhibition at the museum, but in brief, here's why those refugees were in Shanghai. As the Nazis swept across Europe, between 18 and 20,000 Jews, mostly German, Austrian, and Polish, were able to escape certain death by fleeing all the way to Japanese-occupied Shanghai. At that time, Shanghai was one of the few places in the world where you could enter without a passport or visa. Most traveled to Shanghai along one of the two routes shown on the map, either a month-long steamship journey or via the Trans-Siberian Railroad and then by ship to Japan and finally another ship trip to Shanghai. Arthur visited the community in Shanghai during Passover and the pictures he took depict the daily existence of the refugees. At the bottom right corner of this photograph, you'll see a box of matzo. This was supplied by one of the Jewish relief agencies that helped the stranded European refugees in coordination with UNRWA. This couple is cooking matzo balls on a Chinese fire pot fueled by charcoal briquettes. She is fanning the coals by hand to generate enough heat. Although the war was over, Arthur found destitute refugees still living in the same dismal crowded conditions they had endured during the war. The majority of Jewish refugees in Shanghai managed to survive despite disease, hunger, and the chaotic wartime economy. In this picture, note the signage. It indicates that one office space was shared by several Jewish doctors in Shanghai. News arrived slowly to Shanghai. In Europe, Hitler's death camps had been discovered as the war ended. Now, relief agencies, including UNRWA, were attempting to reunite survivors with their families. In this poignant photograph, Jewish refugees in Shanghai searched lists of concentration camp survivors posted by relief agencies hoping to find missing family members. Meanwhile, the Chinese Civil War, pitting, pitting the nationalists against the communists, was escalating and the war would soon reach Shanghai itself. The Chinese authorities had taken Shanghai back from Japanese military control, but life was still not settled for the European refugees. It was mounting pressure encouraging all non-Chinese to leave the country. What happened? This is the last photo from the exhibition that we're going to share today. We encourage you to get over to the museum and see the full exhibition. Here are a dozen anxious Jewish refugees sorting a pile of incoming mail. An envelope might contain information about a loved one's fate, a resettlement opportunity, or the documents needed to depart China. The refugees' lives were on hold, just like the lives of millions of refugees throughout the world today. Once again, Arthur Rothstein was using his camera to tell the story of dispossessed people with sensitivity and empathy. While working for UNRWA, Dad captured a portrait of the daily life in China. He had this view of the Garden Bridge from his office window in Shanghai. He showed how people were earning a living after the war. Here are some musicians. This is the genteel proprietor of a curio shop. 
He captured the bustling waterfront by the famous Bund in Shanghai. After his assignment with Unruh was completed, he returned to New York City and Look Magazine. He served as chief photographer and technical director of photography at Look for the next 25 years until the magazine ceased to print in 1971. The very weekend he returned home, dad met mom, Grace Goodman. They had a lot in common and wasted no time getting married. This was the golden age of magazine photography. Look was about people, culture, and the news of the week. Picture stories enjoyed enormous circulation in the era before TV. They were the primary source for news and entertainment. For the next 25 years, Arthur Rothstein created picture stories on topics from medicine, to fashion, to food. He obviously shot in color as well as in black and white. Arthur photographed many celebrities. This is the artist Salvador Dali. And here's a celebrity wedding. This is the receiving line at the wedding of actor Tony Curtis on the left and the actress Janet Leigh. The other fellow is comedian Jerry Lewis, who one can only imagine asked Tony, may I kiss the bride? He did a story on skyscrapers and took this unusual shot of a construction worker. See the Empire State Building behind him? There's a Look Magazine archive maintained at the Museum of the City of New York. It contains thousands of Dad's New York City pictures. You can view many of them online. Dad was extremely grateful for his career and he made every effort to give back to the photography community. During his lifetime, it seemed like he knew everyone and everyone knew him. That's dad with two of his mentors, Ansel Adams. His iconic black and white images of the American West helped to establish photography as a fine art. And Dorothea Lange, whose depression era photo migrant mother you all know. This lovely photograph includes dad with two people he mentored, Tony Vaccaro and Chester Higgins Jr. on the right. A few years ago on an icy winter day, I met up with photographer Chester Higgins Jr. to record a little of his personal history for StoryCorps. Chester grew up in tiny Fairhope, Alabama. In 1967, he was a student at Tuskegee Institute. During his summer break, he traveled alone to New York seeking advice on how to become a photojournalist. Chester appeared at the offices of Look Magazine, hoping to meet with an editor. My dad saw him and asked Chester to stop by his office. Dad asked Chester why he wanted to be a photographer. And Chester explained that he was profoundly disturbed by the absence of positive images of his people in popular media, and he hoped to change that. Dad was impressed by Chester's mission and his chutzpah. All summer long, Dad fed him film, sent him out to take pictures, analyzed the pictures, and introduced Chester to museums and art galleries that opened his eyes to art history. One day, Dad sent Chester to meet the curator of photography at the Museum of Modern Art, who ushered him into the archive. There, among the masterworks from the history of photography, Chester was astonished to see images by Arthur Rothstein. Only then did he realize that his mentor was one of the most significant figures in 20th century documentary photography. Dad sent Chester back to Tuskegee that fall with 60 rolls of film and the promise to continue their relationship. Chester Higgins recently retired after a career of almost 40 years as a photojournalist for the New York Times. Hi, Chester. Dad had a profound influence on the careers of countless young photographers in addition to Chester. Here's another young photographer Dad hired and mentored at Look Magazine. You may have heard of him. It's Stanley Kubrick, who later became a movie director. My father was a teacher at heart. Arthur Rothstein received dozens of, of professional awards. He was a juror at the Pulitzer, for the Pulitzer Prize in Photography, and he co-founded the American Society of Magazine Photographers, which was the first organization to fight for photographers' legal and financial rights. 
During his years at Look and Parade Magazine, he was a visiting professor at many schools, including Columbia University School of Journalism and Parsons School of Design. He wrote numerous columns and articles on photography and published nine books. These include widely used textbooks on photojournalism and documentary photography. Besides being a photographer, Arthur Rostam was also a technical innovator. He invented a photographic process that produced images that appear three-dimensional to the naked eye. This process was used to create cover photos for Venture, a popular travel magazine. In 1965, the two tons of equipment required to make the 3D images was airlifted to Rome, where Arthur photographed Pope Paul VI in 3D for the cover of Venture. Dad told me that the Pope, all dressed up in his papal regalia, jumped up on the flatbed truck that held the equipment to examine the camera. And then he kept all the, po the Polaroids that Dad took to set up the shot. In our limited time today, we're obviously just scratching the surface of Dad's 50-year career. He shot nine American presidents. After Dad photographed, oh, when Dad photographed President Gerald Ford in the White House in 1974, he was surprised to see a white Band-Aid on the president's thumb. President Ford told Dad that he had cut his right thumb opening a can of tobacco. The president was actually an excellent athlete, a skier, very well coordinated, not the klutz the media made him out to be. Anyone can have an accident. Arthur didn't want the conspicuous white Band-Aid featured in his presidential portrait, so he asked President Ford if he could please send out to the corner drugstore for a flesh-colored Band-Aid. The president replied that he got all of his medical supplies for free from the Navy, and the Navy used white Band-Aids. After Look Magazine ceased to print in 1971, Arthur took a job at Parade, the most widely read magazine in America, with a circulation of 32 million copies distributed in 750 newspapers each week. He remained there as photo editor until his death in 1985. For this cover, Dad had a little fun using himself as the model. I'm coming to the end of my talk, but before I show you a few photographs from the family photo album, I want to share with you the remarkable chain of events that led to the rediscovery of all those pictures he shot for UNRWA in China, during, including the picture story of the stateless Jewish refugees. One of my dad's early assignments at Parade was to photograph Kurt Waldheim for a cover story. This was in 1973. Herr Waldheim, who would later become president of Austria, had just been elected secretary general of the United Nations. In 1973, it had not yet been revealed that Waldheim lied about his collaboration with the Nazi regime. Arthur was trying to get Waldheim to relax and smile for his family portrait, so he made small talk. He said, I used to work for your outfit. Waldheim replied, what outfit? Arthur explained, I worked for the United Nations Relief Agency in China. You can only imagine Waldheim's relief. Dad said that before returning to the United States in 1946, he placed his UN photographs in a metal file box for shipment home by the UN. But unfortunately, the box was lost. Dad told Waldheim that he had been searching for his lost pictures for 25 years. And Waldheim replied, perhaps I can help you, Arthur. A week later, Dad received a note directing him to a UN archive warehouse in Queens. With some excavating, he located his dusty but unopened file box. The photographs inside were in pristine condition, and Waldheim invited Arthur, invited Dad, to have an exhibition of the China photographs at the UN. Finally, I will now share a small selection of pictures from our family photo albums. We took a lot of well-documented vacations, and my father wasn't the only my father wasn't the only photographer in the family, let me tell you. My mom, Grace, did some commercial photography and ran a busy portrait studio. For several years, she was the official photographer for the city of New Rochelle, where we lived. 
When my three siblings and I were children, our lives were filled with picture stories. Mom and dad took lots of family photos. They often used us kids as professional models. Quick was a pocket-sized weekly magazine produced by the Look Publishers. And when Look so, and when Quick celebrated its first year, so did I, and Dad put me on the cover. My father's pictures were in almost every issue of Look Magazine and even appeared in my social studies, and, and his pictures even appeared in my social studies textbooks at school. We would often see photographs by mom or dad as print advertisements in magazines and on billboards, sometimes including me and my siblings. Hey, that's me. Here's another example, me and my older brother demonstrating Easy Pop, the prototype for Jiffy Pop popcorn. When I think about our unusual family albums, I'm reminded of my favorite scene from the Mad Men television series. Mad Men, of course, is about the advertising business in the 1960s. The picture magazines like Look, Life, and the Saturday Evening Post were driven by advertising, so I could totally relate to Mad Men. In my favorite scene, advertising executive Don Draper is pitching an ad campaign to Kodak for their new slide projector that looked like this. Of course, this is what we all use to share our picture stories before Facebook and Instagram. The Kodak guys wanted to emphasize the, pro the projector's space age technology, and they wanted to call it the wheel. But Don Draper had a better idea. He said that some customers can develop a sentimental bond with the product. A deeper bond, he said, can be nostalgia. Nostalgia, he said, literally means a painful longing for the past. It's a twinge in your heart. Far more powerful than memory alone. He said, this device isn't a spaceship. It's a time machine. It goes backwards, forwards. It takes us to a place where we ache to go again. Don said, it's not called the wheel. It's called the carousel because a carousel lets us travel the way a child travels, round and round, round and round, and back home again to a place where we know we are loved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Annie and Brody. Um, thank you for a great presentation. Thank <laughs> it you. Was, it was really nice to hear your family story and to see all those great pictures. All taken by dad. Yeah. <laughs> and my mom <laughs> took a few of those at the end. <laughs> An extremely talented family. And uh, we, we don't have much time, but I wanted to um, ask, a couple, ask a couple questions. Sure. Um, and this is for, for you too, Brody. Uh, what part of um, Arthur's work um, really inspired you? Well, of course, the Depression era work was uh, was always something that I was in awe of. But to be honest with you, I was very impressed by the by the the uh, pictures he took it uh, for Look Magazine of celebrities. I was, I love the idea that he knew all these people who we saw up on the screen. Yeah, what about you, Brody? Well, I'm constantly amazed at the, uh, the variety and the uh, artistic insights that he had. Uh, we're still exploring the thousands and thousands of photographs of the Library of Congress archives that are being beautifully digitized now. And it's a real delight to go through there and find images that just are little known and are really striking and should be more widely distributed. So that's been a real, a real joy for me. Yeah, <laughs> and someone in the audience was wondering, um, did Arthur keep in touch with the, re with the rest of his life with the Shanghai refugees um, that he worked with? Uh 
You know, he did not have anything to do with the Shanghai refugees. Uh, not, not much. He had a couple of shows before he passed away of those pictures in New York City. But uh, and, and of course, the one in in uh, at the U.N. in 1974. But uh, but my mother had a relationship with the, that group of people. They 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 called themselves the Shang. What they call themselves? Shanghai the Highlanders. And... Shai Han what was it? <laughs> Shanghai Landers. And... Shai Shanghai Landers. They had a group, like a club, and they and my mom was welcomed into that group and and made a couple of presentations of Dad's photographs. Nice. And um, could you talk? Could you share a little bit more about his um, Shanghai experience? Because I know the bulk of the presentation you wanted to kind of get away from that to actually share most of his other work, with rightfully so, because. A lot of that can get lost, but uh, some people in our audience are wondering about some of the Shanghai stories. Are you able to share some of those or even some of the pictures quickly? Uh, we don't have any more of the pictures right at our fingertips here, but um, I think it's important to note that the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency was a, uh, a initially started as a predecessor agency to the UN. Uh, so it existed before the UN itself existed, although the UN had come into existence by 46. And the UNRWA was directed by Fiorello LaGuardia from New York. And um, so there was kind of a New York connection to the whole exercise there. And it's, it's more widely known for its operation of displaced persons camps in Europe. But China was actually the largest single country effort of the, of the agency. So it's a, it's a little known, uh, enormous a story of enormous effort and, uh, and re relief activities. And the, um, the work in Shanghai was carried out in close coordination with uh, the, joint, the, the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee and uh, other relief agencies that were instrumental. Each had their own roles in helping families there find out what their uh, opportunities were for immigration when they had to leave China, which they, they did. Um, and also, when the war ended, um, the U.S. Army supplied rations uh, to the community so that they could use those rations as ingredients uh, for community kitchens. Right. In, in one of the kitchens in the show, there's a, 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 a courtyard kitchen where people are cooking communal meals. And we've been able to identify that some of the boxes that are beneath the table that are food boxes are actually... U.S. government army ration boxes. Uh, so they were using those foods to, to cook traditional German and Austrian dishes uh, in, in the kitchen there after the war. Nice, and um, we're, we're almost out of time, but I wanted to leave the, leave, uh, leave the floor with you all. But before I sign off, I just wanna thank everyone in, in attendance for sticking with us. Again, we apologize for the delay at the start but I'm glad you all stuck with us, especially on this Thursday football night. And, <laughs> but we, we really appreciate it. And if you have a moment, please take a second to fill out the survey in the chat. Um, the link to our upcoming programs are there. We currently have programs going into March, 2022 available. Um, there's something for everyone. So I hope to see you all at future programming. And also if, what can they continue to find work from you all and hear about Arthur or anything else? Is there anything you all are working on or you have anything you would like to say to the audience? Well, we do have an Arthur Rothstein Legacy Project website and a Facebook page, which is very active, has almost 30,000 followers now. Um, so if you, and you can find links to that through, through our uh, Arthur Rothstein Legacy Project. And, and every week we publish a, um, a picture story and place it on our website and on, uh, face, on our Facebook page using one of Dad's photographs. So ArthurRothstein.org so, is uh -huh. the website. And, uh, and the Arthur Rothstein Legacy Project is, is how you would look it up on Facebook. All right. It was a pleasure having this presentation and working with you all leading up to the program. And I hope to work with you two again in the future. Again, thank you everyone in the audience. I thank really you everybody. You thank you, Raheem. Thank you for the opportunity thank to you. share this work and to have uh, to share it with some of the survivors in the, in the uh, Skokie area who have contributed their 
their materials to yes. the exhibition too. That's uh, really important and exciting for important us. Important to honor those survivors, absolutely. Yeah, all right, have a great night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.